Hi everyone, my name's Hazel and I'm an author and a PhD student and today I thought it'd be fun, I guess, probably not, but um, to do a video on how to develop an effective character. So I just, um, I'm actually in the process of uploading it right now, um, I did a video ranking all of the characters um, from one of my favourite TV shows, Miraculous Ladybug. I don't feel like I was rude or mean and I don't feel like I completely like slated it and tore it apart but I don't feel like I was mm, giving enough I guess ways to make the characters who weren't as well developed better so I thought it was only fitting that I did a video on characters since I kind of do every other video is writing or PhD related and then the ones in between are usually something a bit less serious. So like I said I'm a published author but if you want to know more about my writing qualifications I have a degree in creative writing, a master's in creative writing and a master's in script writing um, and I'm currently doing a PhD in creative writing, literature, mental health and Asia Pacific studies. I'm about a year in. Wow I've done a year of my PhD. I don't feel like I've done enough work for a year. <laughs> Oh god, <laughs> okay, um, but those are like my qualifications, but still at the end of the day, um, writing, I guess to me anyway, is classed as an art form, it's still something that is subjective, so what I personally think makes a good character will not be the same as the next author you ask. Just because published authors say that this is the way to develop your character, you might not like that way, you might not think it's good. At the end of the day, it's down to everybody's preference, but I definitely think learning from other people um, is a good place to start. Hence why I made that video on Miraculous, because I adore the show and I do think some of the characters are really well written. So I decided to like take it apart to see how it worked. Um, I do that a lot with the stuff, my PhD, so um, <laughs> it's kind of normal for me, but uh, yeah, I just felt like I had been mean, even though I don't think I actually was. Like, obviously I had to watch it back as I edited it, and I don't think I said anything rude. Like, I still love the show, and um, I still love most of the characters, um, but yeah, I just thought this was a good way to supplement that video and also help people instead of just being super duper critical about my favourite TV show. Anyway, let's start. So, the first thing you need to consider when you're writing your book slash screenplay slash TV series. Um, I guess in this I'm going to use a lot of examples from films as well as books because like I said I have a master's in script writing, I did a great portion of my creative writing degree in script writing so as much as I'm a published author and I have no interest of at the minute anyway of becoming like a, a well-known screenwriter I still do like screenwriting. So a lot of the things I'm going to say are going to apply to like all three mediums. So books mainly is my medium, um, then I'd probably say TV series is my next like favourite thing to write, and then films. I don't think you could really use this for poetry. Maybe you could? I don't know. I'm not a big poet. I quite like reading poetry. Terrible at writing it unless it's really sad. All my poetry in uni was very depressing. <laughs> Um, but maybe you could use this for uh, scripts, for plays, maybe, I don't know, a stage script. So the first thing you need to consider, and hopefully by this point you have an idea for the plot of your book, your film, what it is you're going to write, you have an idea about the plot. So even if you've got no ideas for characters, you know what the plot's going to be. And if you don't, that's okay, don't worry, you can create characters and kind of like put them off to one side. Sometimes I'll have a character I want to use. So for example, I wrote a book when I was 12 and the book's terrible, but two of the characters from the book I absolutely love and I've just kind of kept them. And I haven't done anything with them yet, but I know, well, I hope one day I'm gonna be able to use them because I love them, but they just haven't been able to fit into any of my projects. So you can kind of like keep a, a catalogue of characters you've created but haven't used yet. Um, but you kind of need to decide whether your uh, book or whatever is going to be character driven or story driven. Now I prefer story driven things, definitely, um, but that's not to say I don't enjoy some character driven things, I'm just, I'm always there for the plot. To me, even if some of the characters are bad, 
if the plot is good enough, like it's interesting enough, I can like get past it. So, uh, unpopular opinion, I really like the plots of Twilight. Do I like Bella? No. Do I like Edward? No. Do I like Jacob? No. The only person I really liked in Twilight was Alice probably and whatever the dad vampire was called. So whilst, yeah, most of the cast were terrible in my opinion, um, I could kind of see past that because I really like the plot of Twilight. Now when something is character driven you definitely need stronger characters than something that is story driven. That's not to say you don't need strong characters in the story, but because there is plot to help it, the characters don't need to be able to stand completely on their own. But with something that's character driven, you definitely need that. And that's not to say there's no plot in character driven things. So for example, I've just finished watching series three of Killing Eve, and it's taken me three series to realize, like I literally only realized in the last episode, that Killing Eve is character driven. Because I was kind of thinking third series, the plot is kind of tenuous, there isn't really much going on, and it's not a terrible plot, it's okay. <laughs> um, but it's definitely about the characters, so you have Villanelle, who's the assassin, and Eve, who's the person trying to catch her, slash the love interest, slash antagonist, honestly. It's an odd show, but um, the characters are really good, so if you want a good example of great characters in something that's definitely more character driven but with some plots. Killing Eve I would say would be your go-to um, and something that's story driven but still with good characters I would say would be something like Harry Potter. Now Harry Potter is a bit of a different case since there are so many characters and if you are new to this or you're not new to this but are looking for some advice I would say keep your cast to a minimum. So. Honestly, characterization isn't my favourite thing, hence why I take apart other people's characters to see how they do it. Um, so I tend to keep my characters in anything I write, to be honest, to a minimum. There are about 18 characters in the book. Obviously, some are more important than the others, like the main character, for example. Um, she's in it all the way through because it's told in first person. But if you struggle with it, it's better to keep your cast to a minimum. However, in Harry Potter, because of the nature of Harry Potter, it's set at a school. Obviously, there are going to be a lot of teachers, there are going to be a lot of children. That's just the way it is if you write something that's set at a school. Unless the school's been abandoned, or no one wants to go there, or something like that. Um, <laughs> but um, Harry Potter is definitely more story driven than carriage driven. But there are still some really solid characters in Harry Potter, uh, like Snape, like Dumbledore. Actually most of the adults are pretty solid I think. Yes, yeah, so you need to decide if it's going to be character driven or story driven, because that will dictate how strong and well developed your characters need to be. Now the next thing I would advise you to do would be to just go online and search up for... I don't really know what their proper name is, I call them a character crib sheet, you've probably seen them. It's usually like a, just a sheet of paper with uh, like at the top it'll say name, age, gender, birthday, favourite colour, ethnicity, hair colour, eye colour, skin colour, heights, weights, build, hobbies, stuff like that. Um, and they do seem a bit odd I guess. Um, <laughs> But to me, I feel like it really helps to flesh out your character. Just, you know, get the basics down, get it down. And it doesn't have to be set in stone if you put down their favourite colour as being pink. But decide later on, actually, the favourite colour is going to be orange. That's fine. And, and even if you change their favourite colour, it more than likely isn't going to come into play in the novel or in the TV show or whatever. But by adding all this extra information can build a nice background to frame your character with. So your readers or your viewers may never find out that the main character's favourite colour is orange but it just gives you, the writer, it makes you view the character with more life, makes them more full. So no, your character may never say my favourite colour is orange guys but it just gives you the fuller picture even if no one ever knows. And also by adding things in maybe like their religion but maybe their religion isn't a main focal point of the novel, it, it can maybe add a different undertone to it. I talked about this briefly in my um, let's write a novel in quarantine video and I'll link it in whatever corner it is and down below. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. 
but I think this is a good place to start and from here so one of my creative writing tutors and I didn't really feel like I got that much from my creative writing course but this was one piece of advice that I really resonated with and he always said like don't worry when we give you assignments and you don't always have the idea of what you're gonna do straight away because once you've been given the idea like your brain's been told okay we have to write a 2000 word short story by the state and your brain will like take it on board it knows it has to do it and maybe a week or two later you come up with an idea maybe only a tiny idea maybe it's the full idea but your brain he kind of phrased it as your brain takes the idea for a walk if you're trying to think of an idea for something whether it's the plot or character don't think really hard about it just you know register you want to come up with something or you need to come up with something if it's the case of like a university assignment so register the thought and then carry on this tutor always said he got the best writing ideas when he was doing mundane things like walking his dog you know he wasn't really thinking he was just kind of zoning in and out you know it's just walking the dog and just walking it's not hard but that's when he would get most of his ideas i get quite a lot of my ideas when i'm doing something like washing up or walking to work things like that also things to consider when you're filling out this character crib sheet is if this is your first time writing anything or creating a character like this i would advise you to make a character like you and you can obviously always change them later but sometimes it's better to make a character like you and when i say like you i don't mean identical to you but uh similar so maybe the same gender as you same ethnicity um same religion uh same hobbies um maybe same appearance or slightly altered appearance like if you have a beard and mustache maybe you just give them a beard something like that i just find that helps people and generally most writers usually have at least one person in their book who is somewhat similar to them i would also think about that in a conflict what exactly is it that you know gets them annoyed? What are they worried about right now? It doesn't have to be anything massive. They don't have to be like working for the American government and they're in a conflict is how they're gonna deal with national security. It can be something like, I'm worried I'm gonna get detention. In a conflict can mean a lot of different things and yeah, it can be super serious or it can be something more frivolous, I guess. So in Macbeth, Macbeth's in a conflict is that he wants to be king and in order to do that he's gonna have to murder the king and frame it on his two sons and arguably at the start of the play Macbeth's a pretty good guy he has good morals he doesn't want to do that but his wife is egging him on that's a good inner conflict but like I said it doesn't have to be as serious as wanting to kill the king um, it can be something more frivolous as long as it's important to the main character you need to impress the importance of it if it is something more frivolous you need to make a point of being like this is why this in particular is important as you're coming to the end of this process you also need to consider what skills the character needs in order to help progress the plot of whatever it is you're writing now if you don't have a plot by this point obviously you won't know this but if you do know the plot by this point you need to take into consideration so for example in my novel it's a science fiction novel and there is call for my main character to have some knowledge about uh, computers and like electrical engineering so therefore i gave her an interest and an ability in that general kind of field however looking back on it now as much as i think i pulled it off i don't know anything about that so again it's kind of like write what you know what are your skills and abilities that may be a bit unique that you could use in this book so once you've got to the end of this crib sheet and do it for all of the characters you want you don't have to just do it for the main character you can do it for a random extra who says two lines if you want it's up to you who you do it for um i would say do it for everyone i did it for everyone uh in my novel um i think it's a good exercise even if it does seem a little bit juvenile but um, I think it's a good exercise and by the end of this you'll probably come to a decision on the character archetypes they all fit into. Now character archetypes they aren't a hard and fast rule you don't have to use them but generally even without knowing because you've read books you've seen tv you've seen films you kind of already know the character archetypes even if you don't know the names of them you kind of know the general roles people fit into 
Now, to me, there are like two distinct kinds of character archetypes. There are ones that are like the types of people, so as in a, a bad boy, a perfectionist, um, stuff like that, uh, the orphan, things like that, those are the kinds of personality archetypes. What I mean is the character archetypes, as in the roles people in books and films fit into. Uh, however, like I said, it's not a hard and fast rule, these archetypes. Generally, most characters fit into more than one role within their book or their film. So you can Google all these online, and I was trying to look last night, and I was like, oh, is there like a set number? Shall I mention them all? And the first result, five archetypes, next result, nine archetypes, next result, 200 archetypes. It can go on forever. There are loads of different ways to describe types of people and types of character. But um, I tried to pick out the main ones that I think everybody would understand. So the first one, you probably already know this, is the hero, the main character, the protagonist. So you usually have a character who fits into that role. There's usually only one person, but sometimes you can have like a buddy movie where uh, something like Thelma and Louise or um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid where you'll have usually no more than two people fitting into the role of the hero. Um, but the hero doesn't have to be inherently good, they don't have to be inherently bad, they can fit in the middle and be something called an anti-hero. Everyone loves an anti-hero. So an anti-hero is someone who is arguably a good person, but whatever quest they've been given in the scheme of the plot of this book, they don't particularly want to partake in and they've kind of been forced to do it, they've been forced into this, they don't want to do it. So for example Hamlet. He, he doesn't really care, he just wants to grieve for his dad, he doesn't want to be part of it. It's a bit like the guy in the Disney film Enchanted, who's always like, why we will be singing all the time. Or like Flynn in Tangled, he's always questioning why, why everyone's so happy and singing, he's just like, oh. he's a bit of an anti-hero. Uh, of course you can have more extreme versions than two Disney characters, but um, an anti-hero is generally someone who doesn't want anything to do with the plot of what's going on. Um, but by the end of the film or the book, they accept it and yeah, get on with it, essentially. So the next one is obviously the complete opposite, the villain of the show. Um, they're usually bad people, however, I think the best villains are the ones where they think they are right. You know, they feel like what they are doing, even though arguably bad, is what's best for them, for their family, for their love interest, for the human race, depending what your plot is. You will probably have at least one hero and at least one villain. So when I said before when you can usually only have maximum of two heroes, you can definitely have more than one villain in a piece. There are like seven people who could be classed as villains in my novel. So you can definitely have more villains than just one or two if you want, if that's what you need for the story. The next person is the mentor. So this is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, they mentor, they teach the main character, they help them in some way. And in some films this is definitely more obvious than others. So for example something like The Karate Kid, the mentor is a very obvious figure. Again in Harry Potter the mentor obvious figures, the teachers at the school are mentors and they teach Harry different things. Um, and sometimes the mentor is the main character. If you've seen School of Rock, Jack Black is the main character but he's also the mentor to the children. So the mentor usually teaches the character something and in a way ends up teaching the reader or the viewer something. The next person is uh, probably my favourite uh, character role and it's the best friend. The best friend of the main character. Um, I think you always need a best friend even if they don't get on that well. I think the best friend is great. One of my favourite films, The Princess Diaries, the best friend, Lily. She's great. <laughs> um, and again, the best friend can fit into other roles. The best friend could maybe end up being a villain. They could end up being a love interest or simultaneously be an interest, depending um, on how the character feels. And they are there for the, the moral support. That's their role. They're there to morally support or if it's a more like action, uh, thriller based thing, it could be literally like physical support as well. And when I say best friend, they don't actually have to be the person's friend. They could just fit in the role. So for example, in Die Hard 3, the best friend, arguably, character, who's also kind of a hero, is Samuel Jackson's uh, Zeus character. Um, he is the best friend 
of uh, Bruce Willis's character and um, they only meet at the start of the film and the film takes place over the course of an entire day so quite obviously they're not you know best friends they've only known each other for a couple of hours but he takes that place of a best friend he morally supports um, McLean and he also offers him physical support because it's you know it's an action film so they don't always have to be like a literal best friend have grown up together, have friendship bracelets, know everything about each other. Don't try and take these roles so literally. There are no hard and fast rules to this. Like I said at the start of the video, writing is kind of like an art form and because it's like an art form, it's also kind of subjective. So if your characters don't perfectly fit into any of these archetypes, don't worry, it's, it's not a problem. It's kind of like when you know the rules of writing, that's when you can break them and bend them and do what you want with them. You can't break the rules until you know the rules, sort of thing. Not that there really are many rules to writing, unless it's like stuff like grammar, then of course yes there are rules there and you shouldn't break those rules because grammar is life. <laughs> Saying that my grammar is terrible. <laughs> but anyway, the next um, archetype is called the gatekeeper, but I've heard it referred to as really uh, kind of posh. The Threshold Guardian and essentially they um, block the way to the plot of the rest of the book of the rest of the film. So for example uh, Hagrid in Harry Potter he's a Threshold Guardian he literally comes to take Harry to diagonally to Hogwarts. He is a Threshold Guardian in Harry Potter. Another one would be in the first Hobbit film An Unexpected Journey. Bilbo doesn't want to go on this quest um, and Gandalf is first of all the mentor but by his appearance, by his urging and his kind of also best friend role, he is a threshold guardian and he gets Bilbo to come with him. And Bilbo is also kind of like a threshold guardian unto himself in that it's also himself and his own thoughts and feelings that are holding him back rather than anyone else. Other good threshold guardians are usually in coming of age films and my favourite coming of age film is the animated film Robots. That's a great coming of age film about a robot named Rodney, played by Hugh McGregor. I love Hugh McGregor. He wants to become a big inventor in Robot City, in the big city, but he lives in this tiny, tiny town called Rivet Town. Um, and both he and his dad, and his dad is also like a mentor, um, become the Threshold Guardians and decide he needs to go and do this. So, like I said, there are no hard and fast rules. Most characters fit into the very least two archetypes, if not more. And I think the final most important archetype is the love interest. Um, generally who the hero is in love with. It's fairly self-explanatory, that's their role. Someone is in love with them. However, again, don't take it as literally as that. It's not always someone they are in love with, like a romantic attraction based thing. It can be something like uh, the main character's son or daughter or other family relative who they feel the need to protect. Or to save in some way. That's generally the role of the love interest, is either to win them over or protect or save in some way. So in the film Flight Plan with Jodie Foster, it's about a lady and her daughter who are flying back home uh, with a dead body. It's her husband has died. That sounds really ominous. Just flying home with dead body, as, as you do generally. <laughs> um, so they're flying home and during the flight her little girl goes missing. Um, but apparently no one else has ever seen this little girl and she kind of gets gaslit into believing this child never existed and she's already in like a precarious mental state because her husband's just dead, you know? So in that film there's definitely no romance, it's all thriller, but the child takes the place of the love interest because the main character is invested in their safety, wants to protect them and does love them, it doesn't have to be in a romantic way. They just take the role of the love interest. They don't have to be someone the main character wants to marry. It can be a child, it can be even a pet. It doesn't always have to be as cut and dry as someone the main character is in love with. Uh, like I said before, there are loads and loads of other ones like the femme fatale, uh, the bad boy, the orphan, uh, the super intelligent person. Yeah. You know, there are loads, but to me a lot of them seem to be more personality archetypes. I feel that the hero, the villain, the mentor, the threshold guardian, and the love interests are probably the most important. And it doesn't matter if your character doesn't fit perfectly in them, and it doesn't matter if your character fits into more than one of those roles. Most characters will end up fitting into more than one. 
so don't worry about it. Um, they're guidelines, not rules, and they're more of there to help people who are new or to help people who aren't new but are stuck and they just need a bit of help. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. But I think it's useful to look at the archetypes and see where they all fit in and to see if that might be able to help you flesh out the characters more. So you've got all your characters, you know all the names, hopefully by this point. By the way, you don't have to give your characters names straight away, but I would advise getting them eventually because what I have to do is I don't refer to them as like this person with brown hair. I tend to give them an, like a placeholder name and if I use that placeholder name for too long I will end up associating that name with that character and then it's really hard in my like brain to like try and change that placeholder name. So um, <laughs> you should give them a name as soon as possible in my opinion. Now you've got your characters, you've probably got your plots and you know quite a bit more about your characters as well and I wouldn't start writing yet. Hit me out, <laughs> okay? I think it's the best that you live with these characters for a bit. So recently I've been watching a lot of art YouTubers and they'll take like um, a prompt, for example, a fruit, and this particular artist will be like, okay, I want to draw a person who's like strawberry themed. And they'll draw a series of small designs on one side of the page of like, okay, maybe their hair could look like this, they could wear this. No, I don't like that. Let's try something else. And then on the next page, they will draw the final piece, which is usually a culmination of maybe the hair from sketch one, the shoes from sketch six, the top from sketch three, you know, things like that. So I think it's best to live with these characters a bit, see how they are, see what you want to change, you know, it's the same way when you draft a novel. The first draft isn't going to be perfect and your first ideas for a character aren't going to be perfect. By the time you're finished with your character, who are arguably never finished because they're going to develop as you write it, as in the character you write at the start of the book should be somewhat different to the character at the end of the book. By the end of the book the character should have improved and developed and I think I want to do a video on that actually about character development and how to write them. This is purely about creating a good character, not about actually writing it. This is before the writing starts. Um, but I think it's best to live with them for a bit, see what you want to change. Maybe you just want to change something as frivolous as their hair colour. But if you write a 90,000 word novel, you've got to go through all of that and find every single instance where you described their hair and change it. It's just better to live with them for a bit and really hone in on, is this what you want your character to be? And at this point, I would look at developing things like their gestures, their dialogue. You know, if you have a dialect, which if you're new to writing, I wouldn't recommend writing a dialect in unless it's just random phrases here and there because Dialects are so hard. I was going to have Cockney accents in my novel because it's set in London. But I couldn't be bothered because <laughs> it's too hard and I'm not Cockney. I didn't want to insult a lot of Cockney people. So um, it's just one of those things, you know. But I wouldn't recommend that personally. But if you want to have a stab at it, it can be something definitely fun. Maybe, you just have, maybe if you just have one character who's a really strong accent and you want to show it through their dialogue and their dialect. Also look at things like gestures, does one bite their lip a lot, does one person bite their finger a lot, or do something with their hair, or... I remember once in my geography exam in high school, the boy sat a few desks in front of me. He did this weird thing with his foot, like with, like every so often, like maybe like every 10 minutes, he would drag his right foot weirdly across the floor of the gym. I mean, first of all, it was very distracting every 10 minutes for that to happen because it was kind of loud, but it was just like, oh. Okay. And he actually did it every single time he sat down. He never did it when he stood up, only when he was sat down. So I actually went to college with him and we had maths class together and he did it in the maths class. And I was like, oh, it's just a thing you do. So it doesn't, everyone doesn't have to have it. It doesn't have to be something overly obvious. Just maybe something to make them stand out. And if particularly you're writing a film and the film has got to do with maybe something like fashion or self-expression through something like appearance. It may be a good idea to spend a while with this character so you can develop the style if it's going to be something very visual. But yeah, I'd spend a bit of time with them to see if first of all you want to change them and second of all to develop them even further. You know, what's their dialogue going to be like? Do they have something they always say? So for example in Miraculous Ladybug one of the characters, Nino, he says dude and man a lot and then another character, Alia, when she's talking to the girl she'll sometimes end the sentence in girl. She'll say like, how are you doing today, girl? It's just how she says it. She doesn't say it all the time. It's not overkill, uh, so it's not annoying. But small details like that can really set characters apart. When I did the video on Miraculous, 
there weren't particularly, there were only really two characters who I thought were terrible to be honest. Everyone else was pretty good because they were all very distinct. Everyone's dialogue is distinct. If you made one person read the whole script and there was no animation, I feel like about 80% of the time I would be able to identify who's speaking because everyone's dialogue is so distinct and miraculous. So you need to consider that. Um, and you also need to consider at this point, which is where the character archetypes uh, fit in, about the function of each character. So the function isn't necessarily decided by the character archetypes, but you need to ask yourself when you look at each character, what is their function? And if their function is the hero, they're the main character, they're the one this is happening to, that's fine, you can keep them. You just need to go through each of your characters and see what function they offer, what function do they serve. And if you come up with the answer, they serve no function. Even if you love that character, that does kind of mean you have to get rid of them, unless you can give them a function. And you know, you don't have to like get rid of them completely, you can take them out but reserve them for another project if you really liked them, you don't have to, you know, kill them, <laughs> as it were. Or you can like combine maybe a couple of characters, so maybe you have a character who does serve a function but you're, you're not too happy with how they are, you're not really zazzed about the character, you can kind of combine that character who you do like with that one or get rid of a character you don't like in favour of the character you do like, so they then serve a function. Um, so the function is really important. You really shouldn't be having any characters in there who don't serve some sort of a function. Even if their only function in the book is to serve coffee to the main character every single morning, that's fine, that's a function. It doesn't have to be a big otherworldly kind of function, just a teeny tiny function is okay, don't worry about it. As long as every character has a function, whether it's huge or tiny, that's fine. I guess a way around this is I would try and think of your characters as if they were all in a band. So in a band you usually have the lead singer, the guitarist, the bass player and the drummer and maybe someone on the keyboard. And after that, do you really need anybody else? What's going to be their function if you bring them in? So you can bring someone in, but what's going to be their function? Are you going to bring in a violinist? Cool, that'll sound cool. But is their function only going to be for one song with a violin in? What else can they do? Or are the rest of the songs from here on out all going to have violins in? You know, you need to decide. So if you think of it like a band, or if you've got a lot of characters, think of it maybe like an orchestra. Uh, what's the point of having certain characters if they can't serve multiple functions? So for example, uh, the percussion section of an orchestra, they usually play more than one instrument each. You don't just play uh, just a violin or just a trumpet, they will play several different percussion instruments. So you need to consider what every character's function is, because it's pointless to write a character who serves no function. It's just the way it is. Um, and you also need to consider how much you like your characters, because whether or not you like your characters, will very much influence how well you write them. If you don't like your main character, chances are you are more than likely not going to write them very well or not want to write them very well. There are cases when this doesn't happen, so for example in Miraculous Ladybug there's talk on Twitter that the writers of Miraculous don't like one of the main characters. However, that doesn't particularly come across that much in how a character is written. Um, but you can definitely tell when authors don't like certain characters. And when an author doesn't like the villain, that's okay, because they're the villain. You know, people aren't usually supposed to like the villain, that's fine. But if you don't like your main character, like, people are going to be able to tell, and then they probably won't like the main character either. If you write them in, like, a hateful way, people will notice. Don't think people won't notice, because some people will. Maybe not everyone, but, like, a small percentage, maybe, like, 10% of people will and they, in turn, will also dislike them. So I would consider your character's likability. When I say likability, I also don't mean how much other people in the story like them. If they're the unpopular girl at school, that's fine. But are they a like person? You know, do you like them? Um, because I feel that will really play into the enjoyment of your readers or your viewers. Because you can 100% tell when a writer does not like a character. It's, it's really hard to hide, to be honest. Um, <laughs> So you need to take that into consideration. And if you don't like your main character, change it. So that's why I said like in the last point, spend some time getting to know your characters so there's room to change because 
if you make your characters and the day after immediately start writing and you end up with a 90,000 word novel. Well, well done first of all, that's great. But second of all, if you realise when you read back over it, I hate everything about this main character, how are you going to solve that problem? I mean, you probably can, it's going to be incredibly time consuming, you know, <laughs> and it might not work very well. So I think the overall takeaways from this video, first of all, spend some time developing your character. There's no shame in spending ages planning. Honestly, I spend a lot of time planning, but then write the actual thing really quickly. That's how I work, that's how I've always worked. So spend some time planning and developing your character, there's nothing wrong with that. Look at character archetypes and how other people do it. There's no shame, like I said before at the start of the video, of looking at things you like. So for example, for me, Miraculous Ladybug, there's no shame at looking at characters you admire and see how the writer has done it, you know, take it apart. Maybe you'll look at something, so maybe you want to write um, a young adult crime thriller, go out and find other young adult crime thrillers and look at the characters in them and take them apart. Look for things that are similar to what you want to achieve, whether that's similar in terms of genre of the overall book, a character that's similar to what you want to create, or just a character you really admire. So for example, a character I really admire in Miraculous is Natalie. I think she's the best written character in the whole thing. She's not my favourite by any means, but I definitely think she's a very well written character and I think I have a lot to learn from how they've characterised and developed her. There's no shame in looking at what other people have done in order to improve yourself. I think that's a great thing to be able to do, especially now in this day and age when it's so easy to get access to different films and TV shows and books for either free or very, very cheap. So yeah, and I don't think actually I've put enough emphasis on the inner conflict or the fatal flaw of each character. Every character needs to have something that they care about. Even if they're like a gruff old man who claims to not care about anything, they need to have something that they do sincerely care about which could bring them down. Even if, again, like I said, it's not anything serious. It doesn't have to be about the end of the world. It could just be about whether they get to go on a date or something. You know, um, you really need to consider your character's inner conflict and develop that because the inner conflict to me is what makes characters and it's also what, you know, makes people in real life. Inner conflicts have a tendency to shape people, whether they're over it or still going through it or just started. It shapes people's personalities and not only their personalities, but their perceptions of things. So I think you really need to take that into consideration and I would be on the lookout next time you watch something or you read something, just be like, what is this character's inner conflict? What's their driving force? What's keeping them going? What are they trying to do with their lives? What's their aim? And I think that will really help you. The internal conflict is when a character struggles with something inside themselves. So the example I used before is Macbeth and it really helps shape Macbeth and in the end of the play he just kind of retreats within his own mind and you know if you know the end of Macbeth it's disastrous so um obviously it doesn't have to be disastrous but it's definitely something that needs to be taken into consideration because not only does it help shape characters it helps shape people as well and it'll definitely help with your audience or your reader connecting with a certain character or characters most characters will need in a conflict if they're central you know, if they're just a walk-on extra who just makes coffee every morning for the main character, they probably don't need an inner conflict. But um, if they're fairly central, I would say they do. So uh, I guess that's it for now. I think I want to do a video on actually how to write the character. This was just about character creation, I guess. Maybe that'll be the title, How to Create an Effective Character. Um, but it doesn't matter if you've created an effective character, if you can't use that character effectively in your work and write them well. So um, maybe that'll be my next slightly serious video after a fun one, which I think I'm gonna rank fan fiction tropes, which should be fun because I love fan fiction and I also wanna do a video on fan fiction. I've got so many different ideas for writing. So let me know if there's anything you're struggling with in writing, whether it's the writing itself or like a certain thing in the writing, like, like the setting, the dialogue, or maybe a certain genre. I can definitely, um, do a video on that for you. So if there's anything you would like me to help you with and make a video on, please let me know down below. If it's just a short question, I'll reply to you. If it's something bigger that deserves a, like a bigger exploration, I'll be happy to make a video on it. And also leave your tips down below. What do you do to help create good characters? I think that'd be great if we could all share the knowledge and help other people. Uh, so that's all for now. Bye!